Thank you, team. It's good to see everyone today. I think we can all agree that we missed having Ken up here with his guitar, but we are glad to have him here. <laughs> Amen. So uh, we decided we'll give him at least a week off. We'll see. So with that, but it's good to be here. Am I on? I think I'm on. I got a green light. So we're on. So it is welcoming. I'd like to welcome all of our guests that are here today. It's an honor to have you here visiting with us. And uh, uh, we're just excited to be able to speak your word. It's exciting to take communion together today. Uh, we sent Melissa back to Naperville yesterday afternoon. Uh, she regrets not being here. She really wants to be here and not back in Illinois. Uh, she hates leaving home. So uh, we are settled in and really enjoying things. She'll be gone for a few weeks with her clinical work for her completing of her program. And, uh, but she really wants to be here. So I'm gonna wave, say, I love you, baby. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And uh, so, but she uh, misses being here and has a strong desire to be with us all. So she's getting it done as quick as she can. So with that, you can open your Bibles to Acts chapter one and we'll start with a word of prayer. Lord, we come together, we are sinful and fallen people who need you as our savior and you as our sustainer. We need your grace and your forgiveness each and every day. I know I need it. I need your forgiveness. I need your uh, love in my life. And Lord, as we come to your word today, Lord, I pray that you will give me the words that you would have us to hear, the words I need to speak, the words I need to learn and apply to my own heart and my own life. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill and control me. Lord, I pray that we would have open ears and open hearts and open minds to what your spirit is teaching us today. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your son. Thank you for this church family, Lord. And we just want to lift you up and praise you for the God that you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we go through these passages, and we're going to be working through the book of Acts, Sometimes you find passages that are possibly a little bit challenging to say, what are we going to do? In fact, the music team came and said, so, hanging of Judas and the picking of Matthias, how are you going to do that? What are we doing here? Uh, that's understandable. Uh, but we, we go through the passages, and as we were talking this morning, uh, we preach what's in the Word. And there's something that's going to be very key for us that we're going to look at today as we talk about unity in our body. So let's start off as we read. We're going to start in verse 12, and we're going to read uh, through the passage, and then we'll come back and highlight some key thoughts. Ooh, there we go. Let's bring that down. There we go. All right, verse 12. The Bible says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these which with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days Peter stood up among the brethren, the company of persons, in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spake, spoke beforehand, by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us, and was allotted his share in the ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open to the middle, and all his bowels gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, a keldama. This, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all of the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen 
and to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to talk a little bit about how the church operated. And the first thing we're going to look at are four key areas to maintain unity within the church. So we see a few things here in this passage. There we go. In this passage, the first one we see is obedient followers. So as we looked at last week, we know that Jesus had spoke to them just prior to the ascension, and he told them to return to Jerusalem. We spoke about how Jerusalem was a very dangerous and scary place for them, but they were told to go back to Jerusalem. The first thing that we see in this passage is there in verses 12 and 13 that they return to Jerusalem. A lot of times we talk about God's will for our life especially some of the younger people in the church, some of the people that are like, where am I supposed to go to school? Or what am I going to do for my life? Or what's my career? Uh, those of you with families, with children, grandchildren, we talk about God's will and trying to how to pass that on and impart that. I'm going to tell you something, very simple truth. When Jesus says it, we do it. When Jesus speaks to us, that's God's will for our life. When the Bible teaches us something from his word, that's God's will for our life. Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem, and we see that his immediate followers obeyed. Never underestimate simple obedience. Never underestimate that it's a prerequisite for God's plan. They had to be where they were going to be. This is how God was going to work with them. Never underestimate simple obedience. God's word says it, so we obey it. God's will always starts in his spoken and his written word to us. The next thing we see in this passage are the united followers. The united followers. This will be kind of our key, and we're going to come back to this thought throughout today. But verse 14, after he goes through and he lists all of the disciples that are there, he says, All of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. The followers of Christ now were united, and there was a group of them who had come together. They centered this time of worship around prayer and the focus that they had come together. This word that, he, the, that uh, Luke uses here of one accord is an interesting word. It means with one mind. It means with one accord. It means with one passion. One passion. It says to speed along. It actually has a connotation to it of music. And it has a connotation of harmony, of things that come together. As you start to put together an orchestra, a symphony of sorts, that's what the church is going to come together to see, that God brings us all together. And he is putting us all together. And that is what this concept of unity is about. We're not all going to be the same. We're not all going to look the same. We're not all going to think necessarily the same. We're going to have differences in perspective and personalities, and everything about us is going to be unique, just as God designed us. But he's bringing us together to mold us together into one body, into one unified body. And it comes from the passion that we have about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That passion that we have there. But what did these first followers who were coming together with one accord, what brought them that passion? Or what was that passion driving them to? Well, the word is prayer. God brings them to prayer. Now, I was thinking about this, is that were they unified because they prayed, or because they prayed they were unified? And I came to a conclusion, yes, it goes hand in hand. The two go together. God brought them together, this group of people, and they prayed. They prayed earnestly. They were praying for what Jesus had told them was coming, the Holy Spirit. He, they were praying for this thing to happen, to come together, which they didn't know how it was going to happen. They didn't know what it was going to look like. They knew that it was coming and it was going to be amazing. They prayed together. And he gave us a list of who these people were. We have the 11 disciples. We have women followers of Christ. Don't underestimate that. The fact that that's called out is there. In the culture of the day, there was a hierarchy that was part of the culture. Women weren't in the public circle. Women weren't allowed to be a part of things. They were much more followers and subservient, and they were not taken care of. What we see in the Bible is that it was transformative. We're going to read a verse here in a moment that talks about that, Galatians 3.28. But the fact that they call out the women that they were there, that they were serving with them and ministering with them, it was critical. 
It's a very important thing. We understand that. Now, we believe in complementarianism. We understand that God gave us different roles and different responsibilities, and we believe in that and we practice that. But do not think for a moment that we are denigrating anybody. That in fact, the fact that they are being identified and called out in these passages is very important. They are valuable. They were needed. They were a part of this group. It's very culturally significant that they were identified as even being there. We see the fact that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. And we see that his brothers were there, and probably some sisters too. Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 to 56, tells us of the brothers' names. They're listed there, as well as in Mark 6, verse 3. It's James, Joseph, Judas, or Jude, and Simon. And he also had sisters. So that's obviously, depending on what denomination you may have a background with, is kind of earth-shaking. Mary had other children. Mary and Joseph had other children. Uh, but Jesus' brothers were there. It's interesting that there's not a lot of mention of them throughout the Bible. There's a couple of times where they came to visit or they came to try to see Christ, but now they are numbered amongst them. And if you see a couple of these names, you see James here and you see Jude or Judas, those men wrote parts of the Bible even. The half-brothers of Christ, James wrote the book of James, Jude wrote the book of Jude. James was a very early one of the first pastors in Jerusalem of the church. They became followers of them. That's always a challenge sometimes when you have family members that are in the ministry or family members that are there, whether it's your own father, whether it's a brother, a cousin, whoever it is, uncles. It's interesting to see. But these people had came to follow Christ, and they had come to make him their Lord as well. I couldn't imagine being the little brother who's trying to follow Christ as your older brother. That would be something to behold. You know, it's like, why can't you be more like your brother? <sighs> okay. <laughs> But anyway, we see also in verse 15 that there were many others that were there. So they had gathered together in this upper room in Jerusalem in obedience, anticipating what God had told them, what Jesus Christ had told them to do. And there was about 120 people there. This group of the church, this early foundation that's going to be the church, was a great assortment of people. Men, women, probably Jews and others. Listen to Galatians 3.28. The Bible says this. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Lord wants us to be one. We are all on equal standings with Christ. We have the same equal standing of the fact that we're sinners. We are sinners in need of a Savior. We are sinners in need of salvation. We are sinners in need of redemption. Hopefully we are all people who have accepted that Christ, and that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. Races are different. Those things separate. There is no race with Christ. Genders are different. There's no difference in Christ. We are all one inside of Jesus Christ. We also see that we have understanding followers. Understanding followers. Verse 15. Peter stands up as one of the leaders and one of the vocal leaders. You know, we pick on Peter a lot. Peter's the guy who sank in the water when he went out to see Christ. But Peter was the guy who got out of the boat. Peter's the one who swung the sword at Malchus and thankfully only got his ear. But he's the one who stood up to defend. Peter's the one who denied, but he's also the one who learned and humbled himself and said that he loved the Lord. Peter's the one who would boldly say, I am the guy who's going to be here. I'm the one who's going to stand up even more than everyone else. And he's also the one who humbles himself when he fails. So Peter, we take a lot of picking on Peter. But Peter was bold. But what you also see is as Peter was bold and failed, Peter always learned. He always grew closer. He always took his lumps. He always took his lessons. And he learned. But Peter now stands up. And he starts to tell us about Judas. And tell us about what was going to happen. And anybody who says the Bible's boring, or the Bible's you know, not interesting, or it's not there, they'll go watch a, a slasher movie or something horrible like that, but they don't want to read the Bible. There's some very descriptive language here as to what happens. In those days, Peter stood up among the brethren, the company of persons, and all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spake beforehand by the mouth of David. Now, think about that. Last week we read Luke 24, 44, and it talked about how Christ had to fulfill the law 
He had to fulfill the prophets, and he had to fulfill the Psalms. We don't think of the Psalms as much about being prophetic, but there's many prophetic things in the Psalms. He stood up and he said, as David, uh, the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. Now this man acquired a field, talking about what happened after the 30 pieces of silver, with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gashed out. Very graphic and descriptive. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, a kaldama. That is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one dwell, let there be no one to dwell in it. So as we saw that, the scriptures had to be fulfilled. Christ had said that over and over again. And they're finally starting to grow in their understanding. He's starting to understand what's happening. Peter refers to two things here. Psalm 69, 25 is that first part about may his camp become desolate. He's quoting from the Psalms in Psalm 69, 25. The next line, let another take his office, is speaking from Psalm 109, verse 8, about the replacement. Just a quick editorial comment, but look at verse 16 with me for a moment. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand of the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. We talk about Judas, we talk about his betrayal, we talk about his turning from Christ, we talk about his selfish desires, we talk about all those things. But I want to point this out. Not only did he sin, not only did he fail Christ, not only did he deny and, re, you know, and, and give him up, not only did he rebel like that and defect from the cause, he guided others to Christ. Point out and understand and recognize the fact that my sin, my sin will never only affect me. My sin will always impact others. My sin will always be seen and known. The Bible tells us and God tells us that our sin will always be found out. It always has an impact on others. It always will impact those around us, whether it's our family, our friends, it'll impact our testimony. Somehow, some way, those things come out. Judas not only denied and betrayed Christ, he led others to him and led others to be a part of this horrific series of events. And we also see seeking followers. So we pick up at the end of verse 20 where it says, uh, and let another take his office. Let another take his office. So one, of the men, uh, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time, this is Peter still speaking, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these men became with us a witness to his resurrection. So, Peter says, we have 11, we need 12. We have 12. God told us that one of these people is going to have to be replaced. And so now they're going to come up and they're going to be seeking God's will. The apostles have some requirements. Now, the word apostle is something that even today still gets used in certain types of churches and organizations. The apostles were limited to Bible times. The requirements for apostles are laid out here where it talks about them being a follower of Christ during his earthly ministry. They had to be a follower of Christ. The two men, Matthias and um, uh, Joseph, were put forth. These two men had been followers of Christ through his ministry. These were not novices. These were not people who had just come along and, and joined in at the end. They had to be there to be, in order to be an apostle, they had to be a follower of Christ. And they had to be a witness of his resurrection. They had to see Christ raised after his resurrection. And as we see, especially with Paul coming up, we know the stories of the disciples being called. We know Paul's being called. They have to be called or commissioned by God. So when somebody claims to be an apostle, they have to have those three criteria. I'm pretty sure that none of us followed Christ when he was here on earth. Okay? Uh, I don't think we have too many 2,000-year-old people anymore. So we understand the apostle is a term that's there. It's not just somebody who proclaims the gospel. It's not just someone who's a proclaimer of those truths. He's somebody who followed Christ earthly, who saw his resurrected person, and was commissioned by God. As we go through this and we finish this passage, before we move on, uh, it says that they put forward two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, 
show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So casting lots was actually a common practice. It goes back, you can see it all the way back through the Old Testament. Uh, it's the practice that you see in the Bible, but it's not necessarily something that's commissioned going forward. Um, in Matthias's case, it turned out really well. In Jonah's case, not so much. Um, they cast lots on the boat, and like, oh, it's your fault. Okay, so we know what happened to Jonah. But casting lots is something that they practice. It's not something that we did. Um, I don't believe anybody cast lots when you were voting to see if I was going to be your pastor. Um, at least I hope not. But we, uh, it's something that was done. Now, this was a major decision for this early group of believers. This was a very critical point. It's kind of like a big election. They have two superbly qualified candidates. This is not something we're used to. But we have a huge election in this body of people, this group of people. And now think about this type of selection. There's probably some people that really know Matthias well. And there's probably some people that really know Joseph well. And there's people that are going to say, man, Joseph, he's the guy we need. Joseph, he is a great witness. Joseph, he's the one who really lives what he believes. And there's probably people over here that say the same things about Matthias. And they have different personalities. And some people like this person better. And this, some people like that person. There might be even somebody who's saying, man, that's the guy. Maybe they're campaigning for these folks. Maybe we have Team Joseph and versus Team Matthias. I don't know. But think about the selection. This, is a, this could be something that could really hurt feelings. This could be something that could really impact this small and fragile group that's come together. But what we don't see is any conflict. What we see is we see unity. We see unity in their progress. We see unity in their purpose. We see unity that comes from their prayers and their communion and fellowship. We see that they come together. The Holy Spirit comes there. I find it really interesting when, he, when Peter speaks, verse 24. And they prayed. It means all of them prayed. And said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. In their coming together in unity, they are seeking God's will. They are seeking God's man. They are seeking God's will, not their own. And that's a critical part of unity. Our passion and our unity through prayer comes together. I'll point this out too. As they prayed together, it's really hard to have friction. It's really hard to have strife. It's really hard to have enmity between each other when we pray. It's really hard for those things to come. When you pray with somebody for God's will, when you pray for somebody for your path, when you're praying for someone else's needs, it's really hard to be angry. It's really hard to be struggling with that. You have a relationship issue with someone, pray. Pray for them, pray with them. These folks came together in this critical path decision and said, we're going to pray for who God wants in this role. The key to this passage is the unity that they had together. They were of one accord together as they did this. So let's talk for a few minutes about the principles needed for having unity. How do we do this? We're going to look at five key aspects to maintain unity in Scripture. Turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 is a wonderful passage regarding Christ and his humility and his example. The five principles here, the five key aspects of maintaining unity, first of all, start with humility. Humility. Philippians chapter 2 is a beautiful passage. Paul writes this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection, any sympathy, talk about how important this is, complete my joy by being of the same mind, the same accord, having the same love, being in full accord of, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significantly than you count yourself. Let each of you look not on his own interest, but also on in the interests of others. 
have this mind in you, among yourselves, which is in yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being formed, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God hath highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee shall, should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility is the first part of unity. Humility. Paul is encouraging this group in Philippi to say, exalt each other. Lift up someone else. Put their needs and their desires first. And he said, by the way, here's an example. Jesus Christ, God himself, lowered himself to come and be amongst us here on earth, took on the form of a man, not just being the form of a man, but he came in the form of a servant. He served, not coming in as the king, not coming to be worshipped, not coming for all of those things. He served. He came to serve others. He came to sacrifice himself for us, for me, for you. Christ life was one of humility. He was one who came to pay price to serve and to care and to show God's love and forgiveness. The second thing that we need for humility or for maintaining unity is the control of the Holy Spirit. The control of the Holy Spirit. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, just back a couple pages. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 very quickly. Ephesians 4 and the first six verses. We're talking about the Holy Spirit being in control. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Being in line with the Holy Spirit's control will build us unity. When we all submit ourselves to God, to the Holy Spirit, we will have unity. Galatians chapter 5 is a passage we go to in regarding the fruit of the Spirit. But that passage in Galatians 5, 16 to 24 tells us of two examples. We are all controlled by something. We're either controlled by our flesh, we're allowing our sin nature, we're allowing our own desires, our own interests to be in charge, or we're allowing the Holy Spirit to be in control. Once you accept, when you accept Jesus Christ, we talked about this last week, you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into your life. But the Holy Spirit wants you to give over control. The Holy Spirit wants you to be taking, to be handing that over to Him, to allowing Him to fill you. In that passage in Galatians 5, 16 to 24, it says, here's the results of when you let the flesh be in control. It's anger, wrath, strife. All sorts of horrible things. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to be in control of our lives, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's gentleness, it's goodness, it's meekness. All of those things that aid in unity. We have to be under the Holy Spirit's control. Back in Acts, we see in Acts 2.42, I'm going to try not to get too far ahead of myself in my series. Acts 2.42 talks about the things that brought the church together. The third thing that we see is God's Word. The third part of this unity comes from God's Word. Acts 2.42 says that they, the fellowship of the believers, the church that has started out, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They submitted themselves to the teaching and preaching and learning from God's Word. That's out there. God's Word is the source of our unity. We can come up with all sorts of great ideas or things that we think need to be done or, or how we want to live our lives as a church, as individuals, as families, as homes. We can think of a lot of things that how to run and live our life, but unity comes from the centrality and the dependence and the following of God's Word. God's Word is the source of unity. The rest of that verse goes on, in fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. 
We'll get to fellowship in a minute, but the prayers brought them together. Four of the first four principles of unity and maintaining unity in the body of believers is humility, it's control of the Holy Spirit, it's submission to God's Word, and it's prayer. The fifth thing we see there in Acts 2.42 out of our list is the fellowship to the breaking of bread. That's right relationships with each other. Committed relationships bring us unity. So let's take a few minutes and look at principles and guide us towards right relationships within the church. Right relationships within the church. It starts with fellowship. It starts with breaking bread. We're going to have a time of fellowship after the meat service today. We're going to have a meal together. You should get together with your church body and, and share life outside these walls. We have fellowship together. Most churches are really good at fellowship and not good at a lot of other things. You know, and we should. We talk about our principles that we want to live by as a church. We want to exalt Christ. We want to edify the believers. We want to evangelize the lost. And we want to enjoy the body. God brought us together for a purpose. And fellowship is one of those things. It brings us to unity. Breaking bread with each other is a biblical concept, and we should fellowship together with that. Hebrews 10.24, if you'll turn there, is our next. It's encouragement. Hebrews 10.24. Now, as I read this verse, this is a verse that honestly very often gets weaponized. <laughs> it gets weaponized by people like me who say, hey, where were you in church last? Why weren't you in church last week? Why weren't you at the prayer meeting? Why weren't you at every night of revival meeting? Why weren't you there? Now, this verse gets weaponized. It gets weaponized in the wrong way. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 tell us about our being together. It talks about our encouragement that we're supposed to give. The Bible says uh, this. Let me find my spot. I'm sorry. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Why do we come together as a body of believers? Is it because of responsibility, because we have to be here, and if we're not, we're violating Hebrews 10.25? No. In fact, can I tell you something that's really, really key? Church isn't about what you get. Church is not about what you get from being here. We worship the Lord in singing. That encourages us. That lifts up our spirit. But can I tell you something? The worship time, the singing part of the worship time, it's not about you. It's about giving to God. It's not about us. It's not about what I get from church. We come to church, and not just me as a preacher, because I get to give, okay? We come to church to give to others, to encourage others. The writer of Hebrews is saying, don't neglect coming to the body. Don't neglect coming together because you're somebody who needs to hear from you. There's somebody who needs to get a hug from you. There's somebody, and oh, that's not very New England, but, you know, <laughs> that's not very New England, I'm told. But there's somebody who needs to be told that you love them, that they are loved and that they're cared for. Find a way to stir up others in their walk with Christ. It's not about you being bad if you're not in church. It's about the fact that somebody needs you. Do you come to church to give of yourself or do you come to receive for yourself? God wants us to give to each other. Unity comes from that humble giving of others to others. 1 Corinthians, I'll read this verse for you, but 1 Corinthians 1 verses 10 to 13 talks about us being single-minded, of being of that one accord. Paul again writes, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he goes on to say, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you all. So, Paul's saying in this part here, saying, be single-minded. You know, we would never be 
disunity in a church. We're not going to be disunity in saying, you know, who we like to listen to preach or what type of church we go to, or I like that guy. You don't like that guy? That guy said this, and I don't want to listen to him anymore. You shouldn't do those things. Christians get divided all the time over personalities and different people and different people who teach or preach or whatever the case is. Paul's saying, stop all of that and focus on Christ. He's the one who was crucified for you. He's the one who sacrificed for you. Don't follow me, follow Christ. Don't follow Apollos, don't follow Cephas, all these great men who were teachers and preachers and leaders in the church. He's saying, all these folks, we're just trying to point you to Christ. Follow him. He's the one that matters. Be of a single mind, of one accord, one passion. That passion being Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 6, we also see caring and restoring is a source of unity in the church. Galatians 6, 1 through 3 says this. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, ye who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. It's responsible. It is your responsibility as brothers and sisters of Christ inside the church to help someone who's sinning or is in a spot where they have fallen off from Christ, to show them their path back, to restore them in their walk with Christ. We are to engage in each other's lives. And boy, we don't like that. We don't like confronting other people. And what we see here, Paul is saying, be careful Watch yourself, check your own spirit, check your own life. But we don't like to get messy. We don't like to get involved in somebody's life and say, brother, you're messing up. Brother, you've walked away from Christ. You've let something come between you and the Lord. What's the purpose of this passage? Restoration. Bringing them back to their walk with the Lord and walk with the church and their fellowship with their brothers and sisters of Christ. Why? Because your brothers and sisters of Christ need you. We need each other. Paul's saying, if somebody's caught in a transgression, trapped in a sin, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. We should be caring and restoring people to the walk with the Lord and to each other. Reconciliation is the next thing, is the last. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 24 says this, You have heard that it is said, it was said of old, you shall not murder. And whosoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whosoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. Christ is teaching us something here. And if you're ever wondering, if you question whether Jesus was a Baptist or not, he's saying, you know what, there's things more important than the offering box. Okay, so I might be leaning that way. Christ is teaching us here that we need to have right relationships before we worship together. We need to have right relationships inside the church before we give our offerings and our tithes to the Lord. Right relationships are key for unity as a body when it comes to decision-making, to service, to worship. Jesus is saying, don't give me your money if you got sin between you and a brother or a sister in Christ. Don't give me your worship if you have an issue with one another. We're coming to the communion table. Don't take communion if you have an issue with someone in this room, if you have an issue that needs resolved. Don't do those things. Why? Because we're to be unified. Christ wants us to be unified together. He wants us to be connected in that thing. We are a family. We are a body. Christ is saying, get right with God. Be right with him. Be right with your brothers and sisters so that you can worship. When I have strife with a brother or sister in Christ, I have a hard time worshiping together. I have a hard time talking together. I have a hard time relating together. Christ wants us to be unified. He wants us to be unified more than he wants our money. He wants us to be unified more than he wants our service. He wants us to be unified before we are able to come and worship him in spirit and in truth. 
before we enter our time of communion or before we take part of it, ask yourself right now, is there a relationship that I need restored? And if so, do it. Do that before we start. As we talk about this idea of unity, we're going to take just a couple of moments and look at the great example, a bad example of disunity. And we'll be here as we head into our communion time. So turn to one last passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to see how this group of Corinthians went and spent their time as they were heading towards what they called the Lord's Supper. A bad example of disunity. Matthew Henry said this, wrote this. He said, The ordinances of Christ, if they do not make us better, will be very apt to make us worse. If they do not melt and mend, they will harden. The Corinthians were getting hardened by their misuse of the ordinances of the church. The Corinthian church was marked with division. Listen to verse 17 as I pick up there. But in the following instructions, Paul's writing to this church, I do not commend you, because when you came, come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you for this? No, I will not. So Paul has heard rumors that there's division inside this church in Corinth. And he's like, you know what? I can believe it. Their testimony, their report was saying, I heard something bad and you know what? I believe it. I believe what I'm hearing because I know you all. The divisions had gotten so ridiculous that it was even disrupting their coming together for the Lord's Supper. So corrupt relationships lead to corrupt worship. Why is it so important to restore and reconcile? Corrupt relationships lead to corrupt worship. So instead of joining together for a meal, and back then they were still probably practicing the Lord's Supper like they did at the last supper, where they came together for a meal. They broke the bread, they drank the cup, they worshiped in a service type of setting like that. It was probably very similar to what we saw in the Last Supper. But people were being left out. In fact, they came together, they weren't having a nice friendly church potluck. They would come together and some of these people would intentionally come early so they could feed off the food that they brought and consume it all. Some were getting full and getting drunk with, the, with what they brought, and they were doing that to the neglect of others. Remember this early church. This isn't comfortable sitting. This wasn't air conditioning. This wasn't a nice big building. This was a bunch of people who probably had to leave their families, were ostracized by their society, had been kicked out of their homes and jobs to come and worship Christ. Some of them maybe were able to handle it. Others were probably put in destitute status. These people in Corinth had gotten so corrupt in their relationships and their divisions that they were coming together and some of these people were coming and they would set their table over here. And maybe they were there with their friends and they would eat up all the food. And others would come to the thing, to the, to the meal, come together to worship and they would be left out and literally left hungry. They had taken that and they called it the Lord's Supper. They had corrupted their ordinances. They had corrupted their time together. They were partaking without sharing and caring for each other. They were despising each other and they were embarrassing those who came to the church and they were doing it on purpose. They were neglectful. It was a horrible picture of disunity. And what sins caused that, what relationships caused that, what pride, what ego, whatever the case was, it was causing severe disunity. Hop down to verse 27 and we see a somber warning. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread of, or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, and he just spoke about a very unworthy manner of how it was done through division, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Paul writes and says, don't take of the Lord's Supper unworthily. Now, first of all, none of us are worthy. None of us are worthy of Jesus Christ. None of us are worthy of the sacrifice he made. None of us have any status to say, yep, he died for me because I'm this good. We're all sinners. We're all, none of us are worthy. But what's he talking about? He's talking about coming to the table and coming to the Lord's Supper to these folks who had done it so badly. He said, don't come to the Lord's table flippantly. Don't come in disunity. Don't come as a routine. Think it, think, don't think that this makes you spiritual. Don't think that this makes you better than anyone else. Don't think that taking in communion draws you closer to Christ or earns your salvation. Don't come to this unworthily. They came with division and disunity. But Paul commands us to examine ourselves. Examine ourselves before we partake of this table. What is my relationship with Christ? Am I a believer and follower of Christ? Have I put my faith and trust and turned from my sin to follow Christ? Am I walking in communion with him? Am I walking in fellowship with him? Do I have known sin in my life that mocks Christ's death on the cross? Is there sin that I'm not willing to repent of? Is there strife between me and a brother or a sister in the Lord? The answer to all of these things is put your faith and trust in Christ. Make your relationship with God right. Restore these things between you and your brother or sister in the Lord. Do these things before we partake. That's why we don't just pass it out and consume. We receive it together. Take time to pray. Take time to worship the Lord. In my right obedience to God's word, have I followed him in baptism? Have I sought his growth in my life? Am I seeking sanctification and growth? Am I obedient to him? Make these things right with the Lord. Take time and do that. Why? There's danger to this. I think sometimes when we take the Lord's Supper, we do it so routinely that we dismiss the warnings. You know? How many times have we gone through the yield sign on the road and just gone right through it? I do it. And we hope nobody's there. How many times do we not look at our blind spot? How many times do we do that? Okay, I did that yesterday. I almost caused a real problem yesterday. You know, we do things out of routine. We do things out of habit. We do things because it's what we do. We can approach our time in the scripture that way. We can approach a lot of things that way. God says, examine yourself. Be, take this seriously. In this case, he said, there's many that are weak among you. There are people who were sick. Why? Because they took this unworthily. They took it flippantly. They took it out of those things. And he said, some have slept or died. God takes his ordinances serious. This is a commemoration. It's a remembrance of what Christ did on the cross for us. It's also a celebration. We should rejoice when we consume and take in the Lord's Supper. It's a fantastic and a wonderful event that should draw us to Christ. But we have to stop and examine ourselves. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you if there's something that needs corrected. Ask the Holy Spirit if there's something that you need to repent of there. Ask the Holy Spirit, is there someone I need to restore a relationship with? and become unified with. Act on that guidance, make right what is wrong, enter into this ordinance in joy and a right relationship with Christ and each other. I'm gonna call the elders forward as we participate and partake in the Lord's Supper. As we come to the Lord's Supper, we think about commemorating what Jesus Christ did. He came to this earth in humility. He took our sin to the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. He shared, he shed his own blood. He gave up his own body for us to pay the price for my sin, to pay the price for your sin. As we commemorate this, we can have joy in knowing the, what Christ did for us and the freedom and forgiveness that it gives us for our sins. As we start off and we take the bread, we'll pass this out. And as we do, hold it till we meet and we 
receive this together. Scott James, would you pray for the bread? In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was, when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took a cup, which represents his shed blood, Without, remission, without, sin, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. As we take this, hold it, and realize it represents Christ's blood as it was poured for our sins. Ken, would you pray for the cup? Oh Lord God, we thank you for being obedient to the Heavenly Father to go to the cross and shed the blood to wash away the sins of the world. Father, thank you. Praise you, all in the name of Christ. He continues and says, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes in remembrance of him. In Matthew chapter 26, after they had taken the Lord's Supper, 
they went, they sang a song before they went out to the garden. So we're going to sing a song as we conclude our service. So I'll have the team come as we sing together before we conclude. <laughs> 